He was the best. I never had another student anything like him, and you're so lucky to have him here. <laughs> but what Anthony just said about uh, thinking being uh, physically hard, I never even thought of it myself, but he's absolutely right, and it's why we're all depressives and we all avoid <laughs> doing it as much as we can. It really is hard work. Um, this book that Anthony just held up to you, The Odd Woman in the City, it's a memoir, sort of, that I uh, published last year, but indeed it was like 30 years in the making because it, in the end it was composed out of 30 years of notes, of taking notes about something I thought I was going to try to write but never was able to pull it together until suddenly I did. So th this book is actually a collage and I want to, I'm going to read from it, but first I'm going to explain to you how it got written, what, what the parts of the collage are. I have a very good friend in New York, a man I call Leonard in this book. Leonard and I, uh, he's gay and I'm odd. <laughs> so he was, um, uh, we, we became great friends out of our politics, which was feminist politics and gay politics some 35 years ago. And for many, many years, Leonard and I uh, meet once a week, uh, we did for quite a long time, we still do. Um, we take a walk in the city, uh, we have dinner, and we go to a movie. And uh, much of, of, I wanted to write about this relationship because I thought it was paradigmatic of what's happening in the world in our generation. Our generation was the first in which millions of people suddenly are living alone, right? And New York City, half, literally 50% uh, of, of the last census shows uh, single person households in the census. So here we are. He, me, twice married, twice divorced. He's gay, so he avoided that. But he was alone, I was alone, and many, many people that we know are. So our lives, in a way, is, are paradigmatic of modern times. And I wanted to write about that. So I had a situ what I've often called a situation. But the story eluded me. I didn't know how to find a way into a narrative that would build and have narrative drive and have an arc and go somewhere. So I just put it off. It never really came about. And then one day, I suddenly realized it's our friendship and it's friendship and friendship in literature and the city itself that is really the way for me to put it together. I realized what we were, above all else, was urban creatures. We're both New Yorkers to the core. And everything else began to flow around that. So I'm going to read to you today um, from parts of this book, so you get a little bit of all of it. A lot of my, and a lot, a lot of it is encounters between me and people on the street, which is how I live. I'm a great walker, and over many years I've collected many, many anecdotes. So it's about me and Leonard. It's about friendship. It's about New York. Okay, all right. Leonard and I are having coffee at a restaurant in Midtown. So I begin, how does your life feel to you these days? Like a chicken bunk stuck in my craw, he says. I can't swallow it and I can't cough it up. Right now, I'm trying to just not choke on it. My friend Leonard is a witty, intelligent gay man, sophisticated about his own unhappiness. The sophistication is energizing. Once, a group of us read George Kennan's memoir, Kennan was a, a, a diplomat attached to the Soviet Union for many years. A group of us read George Kennan's memoir and met to discuss the book. A civilized and poetic man, said one. A cold warrior riddled with nostalgia, said another. Weak passions, strong ambitions, and a continual sense of himself in the world, said a third. This is the man who has humiliated me my entire life, said Leonard. You can laugh. <laughs> Leonard's take on Kennan renewed in me the thrill of revisionist history, the domesticated drama of seeing the world each day anew through the eyes of the aggrieved, and reminded me of why we are friends. We share the politics of damage, Leonard and I, an impassioned sense of having been born into preordained social inequity burns brightly in each of us. Our subject is the unlived life. The question for each of us, would we have manufactured the inequity had one not been there ready-made? He is gay, I am the odd woman, for our grievances to, to make use of. 
To this question, our friendship is devoted. The question, in fact, defines the friendship, gives it its character and its idiom, and has shed more light on the mysterious nature of ordinary human relations than has any other intimacy I have known. For more than 20 years now, Leonard and I have met once a week for a walk, dinner, and a movie, either in his neighborhood or mine. Except for the two hours in the movie, we hardly ever do anything else but talk. One of us is always saying, let's get tickets for a play, a concert, a reading, but neither of us ever seems able to arrange an evening in advance of the time we are to meet. The fact is, ours is the most satisfying conversation either of us has, and we can't bear to give it up even for a week. It's the way we feel about ourselves when we're talking that draws us so strongly to each other. I once had my picture taken by two photographers on the same day. <clears throat> Each likeness was me, definitely me, but to my eyes, the face in one photograph looked broken and faceted, the one in the other of a piece. It's the same with me and Leonard. The self-image each of us projects to the other is the one we carry around in our heads, the one that makes us feel coherent. Why then, one might ask, do we not meet more often than once a week, take in more of the world together, extend each other the comfort of the daily chat? The problem is we both have a penchant for the negative. Whatever the circumstance, for each of us, the glass is perpetually half empty. Either he is registering loss, failure, defeat, or I am. We cannot help ourselves. We would like it to be otherwise, but it is the way life feels to each of us, and the way life feels is inevitably the way life is led. <clears throat> One night at a party, I fell into a disagreement with a friend of ours who was famous for his debating skills. At first, I responded nervously to his every challenge, but soon I found my sea legs, and then I stood my ground more successfully than he did. People crowded around me. That was wonderful, they said, wonderful. I turned eagerly to Leonard. You were nervous, he said. Another time, I went to Florence with my niece. How was it, Leonard asked. The city was lovely, I said. My niece is great. You know, it's hard to be with someone 24 hours a day for eight days, but we traveled well together, walked miles along the Arno. That river is beautiful. That is sad, Leonard said, that you found it irritating to be so much with your niece. Every time I went to the beach. The third time, I went to the beach for the weekend. It rained one day, was sunny another. Again, Leonard asked how it had been. Refreshing, I said. The rain didn't daunt you, he said. I remind myself of what my voice can sound like. My voice forever edged in judgment. That also never stops registering the flaw, the absence, the incompleteness. My voice that so often causes Leonard's eyes to flicker and his mouth to tighten. At the end of an evening together, one or the other of us will impulsively suggest that we meet again during the week, but only rarely does the impulse live long enough to be acted upon. We mean it, of course, when we are saying goodbye, want nothing more than to renew the contact immediately, but going up in the elevator to my apartment, I start to feel on my skin the sensory effect of an evening full of <laughs> irony and negative judgment. Nothing serious, just surface damage, a thousand tiny pinpricks dotting arms, neck, chest, but somewhere within me, in a place I can't even name, I begin to shrink from the prospect of feeling it again soon. A day passes, then another. I must call Leonard, I say to myself, but repeatedly the hand about to reach for the phone fails to move. He, of course, must be feeling the same, as he doesn't call either. The unacted upon impulse accumulates into a failure of nerve. Failure of nerve hardens into ennui. When the cycle of mixed feeling, failed nerve, and paralyzed will has run its course, the longing to meet again acquires urgency, and the hand reaching for the phone will complete the action. Leonard and I consider ourselves intimates because our cycle takes only a week to complete. I have always lived in New York. but a good part of my life, I longed for the city the way someone in a small town would yearning to arrive at the capital. Growing up in the Bronx was like growing up in a village. From earliest adolescence, I knew there was a center of the world and that I was far from it. At the same time, I also knew it was only a subway ride away, downtown in Manhattan. Manhattan was Araby. At 14, I began taking that subway ride, walking the length and breadth of the island, late in winter, deep in summer. 
The only difference between me and someone like me from Kansas was that in Kansas, one makes the immigrants' lonely leap once and forever, whereas I made many small trips into the city, going home repeatedly for comfort and reassurance, dullness and delay, before attempting the main chance. Down Broadway, up Lexington, across 57th Street, from river to river, through Greenwich Village, Chelsea, the Lower East Side, plunging down to Wall Street, climbing up to Columbia. I walked those streets for years, excited and expectant, going home each night to the Bronx where I waited for life to begin. The way I saw it, the west side was one long rectangle of apartment houses filled with artists and intellectuals. This richness, mirrored on the east side by money and social standing, made the city glamorous and painfully exciting. I could taste in my mouth, world, sweet world. All I had to do was get old enough and New York would be mine. As children, my friends and I would roam the streets of the neighborhood, advancing out as we got older, section by section, until we were little girls trekking across the Bronx as though on a mission to the interior. We used the streets the way children growing up in the country use fields and rivers, mountains and caves, to place ourselves on the map of our world. We walked by the hour. By the time we were 12, we knew instantly when the speech or appearance of anyone coming toward us was the slightest bit off. If a man approached and said, how you doing girls? You girls live around here? We knew. If a woman wasn't walking purposefully toward the shopping street, we knew. We knew also that it excited us to know. When something odd happened, and it didn't take much for us to consider something odd, our sense of the norm was strict. We analyzed it for hours afterwards. A high school friend introduced me to the streets of Upper Manhattan. I don't know if you know the layout of the city. There's Manhattan and it's surrounded by the boroughs. The Bronx is at the northern end of Manhattan. So I was coming downtown. Uh, downtown was a magical word when I was a girl. A high school friend introduced me to the streets of Upper Manhattan. Here, so many languages and such striking peculiarities in appearance. Men in beards, women in black and silver, these were people I could see weren't working class as we were, but what class were they? And then there was the hawking in the street. In the Bronx, a lone fruit and vegetable man might call out, Mrs. Fresh Tomatoes today. But here, people on the sidewalk were selling watches, radios, books, jewelry in loud, insistent voices. Not only that, but the men and women passing by got into it with them. How long will that watch work? Till I get to the end of the block? I know the guy who wrote that book. It isn't worth a dollar. Where'd you get that radio? The cops will be at my door in the morning, right? So much stir and animation. People who were strangers talking at one another, making one another laugh, cry out, crinkle up with pleasure, flash with anger. It was the boldness of gesture and expression everywhere that so captivated us. The stylish flirtation, the savvy exchange, people sparking witty, exuberant responses in one another, in themselves. In college, another friend walked me down West End Avenue. I'd never seen a street as wide and stately as this one, with doormen standing in front of apartment houses of imposing height that lined the avenue for a mile and a half. My friend told me that in these great stone buildings lived musicians and writers, scientists and emigres, dancers and philosophers. Very soon, no trip downtown was complete without a walk on West End Avenue, that's the Upper West Side, from 107th Street to 72nd Street. For me, the avenue became emblematic. To live here would mean I had arrived. I was growing up in a tenement district in the Bronx, and this was a wide, beautiful avenue. <coughs> I was a bit confused about whether I'd be the resident artist intellectual or be married to him. I couldn't actually see myself signing the lease. But no matter, one way or another, I'd be in the apartment. In summer, we went to the concerts at Lewiston Stadium, the great amphitheater on the City College campus. It was here that I heard Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms for the first time. City College was the school I went to. These concerns came to an end in the mid-60s. But in the late 1950s, sitting on those stone bleacher seats, July after July, August after August, I knew, I just knew, that the men and women all around me lived on West End Avenue. As the, as the orchestra tuned up and the lights dimmed in the soft, starry night, I could feel the whole intelligent audience moving forward as one, yearning toward the music, toward themselves in the music. 
as though the concert were an open air extension of the context of their lives. And I, just as intelligently I hoped, leaned forward too, but I knew that I was only mimicking the movement. I'd not yet earned the right to love the music as they did. Within a few years, I began to see it was entirely possible that I never would. As I saw myself moving ever further toward the social margin, nothing healed me of a sore and angry heart like a walk through the city. To see in the street the 50 different ways people struggle to remain human, the variety and inventiveness of survival technique was to feel the pressure relieved, the overflow draining off. I felt in my nerve endings the common refusal to go under. That refusal became company. I was never less alone than alone in the crowded street. Here I found I could imagine myself. Here I thought I am buying time. What a notion, buying time. It was one I shared with Leonard for years. I grew up and moved downtown, but sure enough, nothing turned out as expected. I went to school, but the degree did not get me an office in Midtown. I married an artist, but we lived on the Lower East Side. I began to write, but nobody read me above 14th Street. For me, the doors to the Golden Company did not open. The glittering enterprise remained at a distance. At a New Year's party, Jim comes rushing toward me. Sarah nods and turns away. A year ago, I was tight with one, two years ago with the other. Tonight, I realize I haven't seen him in three months, her in six. A woman who lives three blocks from me appears, her eyes shimmering. I miss you, she breathes wistfully, as though we're lovers in wartime, separated by forces beyond our control. Yes, I nod and move on. We'll embrace happily, me and all these people, not a glance or grievance, not a syllable of reproach among us. And indeed, there is no call for grievance. Like pieces in a kaleidoscope that's been shaken, we've all simply shifted position in the pattern of intimate exchange. Many of us who not so long ago were seeing one another regularly will meet now more often by accident than by design. In a restaurant, on the bus, at a loft wedding. Ah, but here's someone I haven't seen in years. Suddenly a flare of intensity and we're meeting once a week for the next six months. I'm often reminded of the tenement friendships in my childhood. Circumstantial one and all. Round, dark-eyed women filled with muted understanding for the needs of the moment. What difference did it make if the next door neighbor was called Ida or Goldie when you needed someone to lend you 10 bucks or recommend an abortionist or nod her head during an outburst of marital rage? It mattered only that there was a next door neighbor. These attachments, as Sartre might have put it, were contingent rather than essential. As for us, never us now, Never before in history has so much educated intelligence been expended on the idea of the irreplaceable, the essential self. And never before has aversion to the slightest amount of psychological discomfort allowed so many to be treated as the contingent other. In the drugstore, I run into 90-year-old Vera, a Trotskyist. You know, that, that was a variant of left-wing thinking before you were born, <laughs> but not before she was born. <laughs> in the truck store, I run into 90-year-old Vera, a Trotskyist from way back who lives, he's an old, old curmudgeon and an old socialist, who lives in a fourth floor walk up in my neighborhood and whose voice is always pitched at the level of soapbox urgency. She is waiting for a prescription to be filled and as I haven't seen her in a long while, on impulse, I offer to wait with her. We sit down in two of the three chairs lined up near the prescription counter. Me in the middle, Vera on my left, and on my right, a pleasant looking man reading a book. Still living in the same place, I say, I ask. Where am I gonna go, she says, loudly enough for a man on the pickup line to turn in our direction. But you know, darling, the stairs keep me young. And your husband, how's he taking the stairs? Oh, him, she says, he died. I'm so sorry, I murmur. Her hand pushes away the air. It wasn't a good marriage, she announces. Three people on the line turn around. <laughs> but you know, in the end, it doesn't really matter. I nod my head. I understand the apartment is empty. One thing I gotta say, she goes on, he was a no good husband, but he was a great lover. 
I can feel a slight jolt in the body of the man sitting next to me. <laughs> well, that's certainly important, I say. Boy, was it ever, she says. I met him in Detroit during the Second World War. We were organizing. In those days, everybody slept with everybody, so I did too. But you wouldn't believe it. And here she lowers her voice dramatically, as though she has a secret of some importance to relate. Most of the guys I slept with, they were no good in bed. I mean, they were bad, really bad. <laughs> now I feel the man on my right stifling a laugh. <laughs> so, when you found a good one, Vera shrugs, you held on to him. I know just what you mean, I say. Do you, darling? Of course I do. You mean they're still bad? Listen to us, I say, two old women talking about lousy lovers. This time, the man beside me laughs out loud. I turn and take a good long look at him. We're sleeping with the same guys, right, I say? Yes, he nods, and with the same ratio of satisfaction. For a split second, the three of us look at one another, and then all at once, we begin to howl. When the howling stops, we are all beaming. Together, we have performed, and separately, we have been received. I don't know how much more. Um, <laughs> I'll give you another street encounter. This one is um, a little clean. <laughs> a wooden, I think that's what's required. A wooden barrier has been erected on my street around two squares of pavement whose concrete has been newly poured. Beside the barrier is a single wooden plank laid out for pedestrians, and beside that, a flimsy railing. On an icy morning in midwinter, I am about to grasp the railing and pull myself along the plank when, at the other end, a man appears, attempting the same negotiation. This man is tall, painfully thin, and fearfully old. Instinctively, I lean in far enough to hold out my hand to him. Instinctively, he grasps it. Neither of us speaks a word until he is safely across the plank, standing beside me. Thank you, he says. Thank you very much. A thrill runs through me. You're welcome, I say in a tone that I hope is as plain as his. We each then go our separate ways, but I feel that thank you running through my veins all the rest of the day. It was his voice that had done it. That voice, strong, vibrant, self-possessed, it did not know it belonged to an old man. There was in it not a hint of that beseeching tone one hears so often in the voice of an old person when small courtesies are shown. You're so kind, so kind, so very kind, when all you're doing is hailing a cab or helping to unload a shopping cart, as though the person is apologizing for the room he or she is taking up in the world. This man realized that I had not been inordinately helpful, and he need not be inordinately thankful. He was recalling for both of us the ordinary recognition that every person in trouble has a right to expect, and every witness an obligation to extend. I held out my hand. He had taken it. For 30 seconds, we had stood together, he not pleading, I not patronizing. The mask of old age slipped from his face. The mask of vigor dropped from mine. In the midst of American dysfunction, global brutality, and personal defensiveness, we had each of us simply come into full view one of the other. A friend reads, I, I'm going to just go on another few pages and then you ask questions and I'll answer, right? Okay? That's enough, right? A friend reads what I've been writing and says to me over coffee, you're romanticizing the city, the street. Don't you know that New York has lost 75% of its manufacturing base? In my mind's eye, I stare into the faces of all the women and men with whom I interact daily. Hey, you people, I address them silently. Did you hear what my friend just said? The city is doomed. The middle class has deserted New York. The corporations are in Texas, Jersey, Taiwan. <laughs> That's where you are. You're gone. <laughs> you're out of here. It's all over. How come you're still on the street? New York isn't jobs, they reply. It's temperament. Most people are in New York because they need evidence in large quantities of human expressiveness, and they need it not now and then, but every day. They, that is what they need. Those who go off to the manageable cities can do without. Those who come to New York cannot. Or perhaps I should say that it is I who cannot. 
It's the voices I can't do without. In most cities of the world, the populace is planted in centuries of cobblestone alleys, ruined churches, architectural relics, none of which are ever dug up, only piled one on top of another. If you've grown up in New York, your life is an archaeology not of structures, but of voices, also piled one on top of another, also not really replacing one another. On Sixth Avenue, two small, dark-skinned men lean against a parked cab. One says to the other, look, it's very simple. A is the variable costs, B is the gross income, C is the overhead. Got that? The other man shakes his head no. Dummy, the first man cries, you've got to get it. On Park Avenue, a well-dressed matron says to her friend, when I was young, men were the main course. Now they're a condiment. <laughs> On 57th Street, one boyish-looking man says to another, I didn't realize you were such good friends. What did she give you that you miss her so? It wasn't what she gave me, the other replies. It was what she didn't take away. As the cabbie on 6th Avenue says, someone's got to get it, and late in the day, someone does. I'm walking on 8th Avenue during the 5 o'clock rush, thinking of changing a word in a sentence, and somewhere in the 40s, I don't notice the light turning red. Halfway into the path of an oncoming truck, I am lifted off my feet by a pair of hands on my upper arms and pulled back onto the curb. The hands do not release me immediately. I am pressed to the chest of the person to whom the hands belong. I can still feel the beating heart against my back. When I turn to thank my rescuer, I am looking into the middle-aged face of an overweight man with bright blue eyes, straw-colored hair, and a beet red face. Not a New Yorker. We stare wordlessly at each other. I'll never know what the man is thinking at this moment, but the expression on his face is unforgettable. Me, I am merely shaken, but he looks as though transfigured by what has just happened. His eyes are fixed on mine, but I see that they are really looking inward. I realize that this is his experience, not mine. It is he who has felt the urgency of life. He is still holding it in his hands. Two hours later, I am home, having dinner at my table, looking out at the city. My mind flashes on all who crossed my path today. I hear their voices, I see their gestures, I start filling in lives for them. Soon they are company, great company. I think to myself, I'd rather be here with you tonight than with anyone else I know. Well, almost anyone else I know. I look up at the great clock on my wall, the one that gives the date as well as the hour. It's time to call Leonard. Thank you.